United States versus Microsoft Corporation. The seven-member panel of judges heard from attorneys on both sides. I now wish to address the final uh, subject of argument, which is uh, extrajudicial statements and conduct of the proceeding. Uh, I will address them in that order. Uh, it is now apparent that prior to the conclusion of trial, the district judge gave interviews to numerous reporters, uh, certainly at least half a dozen, uh, about the nature of the case, uh, the parties, and the like. Uh, Ken Auletta, a reporter for The New Yorker, reports that he has 10 hours of taped conversations with the district judge, uh, and that in the course of those conversations, the district judge walked him more or less step by step through the journal he maintained during trial. Uh, following uh, these reports uh, did not appear until the entry of judgment, uh, but they did begin almost immediately, I think the next day after entry of judgment. And following the initial reports, uh, which were in uh, leading uh, United States newspapers, the district judge then began uh, a public speaking tour uh, addressing uh, issues related to the merits of the case, uh, Microsoft, and so on. Uh, this tour included uh, a speech in Amsterdam, uh, a speech at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, a speech at St. Mary's College in Maryland, uh, a speech uh, at uh, what uh, I would refer to as a practice development luncheon uh, hosted by the Howery and Simon firm uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, finally another speech at a, an event uh, I think that was sponsored by George Mason Law School but was conducted at the Capitol. Uh, these extensive comments uh, about the case while it is pending uh, are a clear violation of Canon 3A6 of the Rules of Judicial Conduct. Uh, the government's only uh, effort to uh, defend uh, the course of conduct is by reference to the legal education exception to Canon 3A6, uh, and I think that uh, claim is plainly without substance. Uh, speaking to reporters in chambers about a, an ongoing trial uh, is not, I think, meant to uh, uh, elevate the... Uh, uh, you also claim a, a violation of Canon 3A4, don't you? Yes, Your Honor, and, and indeed I was just uh, coming to that point because although 3A6 uh, may be violated by for want of a better word, non-interactive uh, 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 conversations, as for example, where a judge might simply give a written statement to the press uh, or make a state, an oral statement uh, on the record. It's quite clear from the press reports and uh, particularly clear from the reports in Mr. Aletta's book that these were interactive conversations where the reporters were bringing information to the district judge and they were having generally a, a two-way conversation. I think one of the newspaper reports describes it as a, uh, a, f a fairly relaxed uh, 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 two-way conversation. Uh, and th those conversations in which the judge plainly uh, received information uh, 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 extrajudicially uh, constitute a separate violation of Canon 3A4. Now, we don't Can I no ask you, um, are we proceeding here de novo in the sense that, um, as my records show, the first publication indicating that the district court himself had actually given interviews as opposed to a lot of articles published about the case and the judge's background came two days after the order uh, was entered as to the remedy. 
Did you have any opportunity to make any motion in the district court? I think as a practical matter, Your Honor, the answer to that is no. And the reason uh, I say that is that once judgment was entered, that triggered certain time periods during which Microsoft would have been required to take steps that were highly inimical to the company. Such as, public, such as formulating a breakup plan. Uh, and as a result of that, which was essentially having a gun pointed to the company's head, Microsoft was bound to proceed as promptly as possible into this court in order to secure a stay. I should point out that although the district court ultimately on its own granted a stay of the judgment. Uh, if you read the, the, the order entered uh, in June, uh, at the same time the judgment was entered, you would come away with a firm conclusion that the district court was not going to do that. And therefore, as a practical matter, Microsoft was not able to initiate what could have been a lengthy uh, recusal proceeding in the district court. What do we do in light of what you're suggesting? Uh, if you take 3A4 violation uh, that you're asserting, that is the initiation of communications concerning a pending proceeding, and the recusal statute, uh, et cetera, there are a number of possibilities. It does not automatically result in the voiding of a judgment. A judgment may be voidable not necessarily void. Uh, there are the other remedy that we've also used, if you're right, in the Microsoft case was in the event of a remand to replace the judge or nothing. What are you suggesting is the appropriate remedy if you're correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, well, clearly uh, we think that the nature of uh, the violation of uh, uh, the canons <coughs> is such that it almost necessarily uh, uh, triggers a violation of Section 455A. Why is it? Because the case... You mean because of the content of these statements or because any statements that violate the canon trigger 455A? Uh, I wouldn't say that any statement right. that violates the canons ipso facto violates 455A. But what the cases say is that where statements are made that, refl that uh, uh, would cause a reasonable person to believe right. that the district court was not impartial. Right. That's, that's the standard for 455A, not whether they violated that's the canon. I mean, the, the violation of the canon may make it worse, right? But I don't think it's qu that's quite the relationship. Uh, As I read the cases, which are not many, uh, they are reasonably clear that where the judge's statements uh, uh, would suggest that the judge is defending uh, his or her conduct of the, a proceeding, where the statements can be misunderstood by members of the public right. and place the judge in the position where he, he or she appears to be no longer above the fray but has entered the lists and where the statements are, as in this case, uh, reflect a, uh, an animus toward a litigant that is expressed in an extrajudicial form. We don't, we don't know. First of all, we, uh, theoretically, not theoretically, but uh, we, we, the last hour or so we talked about the need for an evidentiary hearing, whether one was required. I mean, all this is hearsay. Um, we have what uh, whatever's been reported in the press or in books, and uh, and that's not necessarily everything. I mean, if you, you talked about ten hours of, of taped interviews with one reporter, and there may be four or five more reporters. So we don't even know the extent of uh, of the statements that that were made. And you know, how, how does one hold an evidentiary hearing on on, on this kind of a question it, to the extent we need one? Uh, is it good enough for the government to say we don't dispute any of these statements? That's not necessarily good enough because there are other statements that are out there that may not have been made their way into print yet. Well, I, I think that uh, that is certainly true 
and it is in the, the nature of this kind of situation uh, that there will be, because the statements are made extrajudicially and are not part of the trial record, that this issue will arise. I think, however, that the number of statements that have been reported to date, their consistency uh, and, the, and the tenor of them uh, uh, should be to, uh, coupled with the failure of the government to deny that they've been made and indeed the failure of the district judge to deny they've been made. Uh, I, I, I myself have seen a tape recording of one of the speeches in which the district judge actually undertakes to defend making the statements, which I take to be an acknowledgment that the there, state... There, there are a couple of theories that swirl around 3A6. One of them is the one that, the, the canon that uh, forbids judges from making uh, public con comment about pending or impending cases. The, the way that canon's phrased, it, it doesn't depend on what court the case is in. Uh, so someone on this court who commented during the O.J. Simpson trial about the handling of that trial would be guilty of a violation of 3A6. And the theory underlying that, as I understand it, is that when judges talk about cases in other courts, they may unduly influence the jury or they may unduly influence the judge who's handling the case, all to the detriment of the party. Now, that theory doesn't apply in this situation. What is the prejudice that, that you put forward as, as a reason for vacating the judgment, given that what Judge Jackson was doing was stating what was on his mind? Uh, yes, I think the logic of the position is this. Where 3A6 is violated in the ways it was violated here by the district judge uh, assaulting essentially a litigant before him in a pending case and also defending his own handling of the case. That gives rise to a violation of 455A. I, I would respectfully invite the court's attention to the First Circuit's recent decision in Boston's Children. Uh, where the comment made by the district judge pales in comparison to the comments at issue here. And what the First Circuit determined in that case was that the comments, because they could be seen as the judge defending her handling of the case, required, that, uh, required recusal, and that that recusal was available on mandamus which the First Circuit describes as not available for cases close to the line. Are you claiming you don't have to show any prejudice? If there's, if there's a violation, a gross violation of 3A6, then there should be retroactive uh, disqualification, recusal of the judge. That be, and the only reason there wasn't in this case is that the district judge kept it secret. If the district judge hadn't instructed the reporters not to disclose the contacts until after judgment was entered. On the first occasion when such a report appeared in the paper, Microsoft would have moved for recusal. And if the district judge declined to grant that motion, uh, Microsoft would have sought a writ of mandamus from this court. At what point, uh, I, I don't recall, at what point uh, at what stage in the proceedings below did the interviews, as far as we know, commence? Uh, well, there, the, 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 two in, the two articles that initially appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal indicated that the interviews occurred during trial without specifying uh, We don't dates. know whether they were at, toward the remedy stage or early or we don't know. Mr. Aletta, uh, being a writer for The New Yorker, is more precise. Uh, his, his, his interviews... Not necessarily <laughs> more accurate. <laughs> I don't dissent. Uh, his inter first interview occurred in mid-September 1999, uh, and it was followed by a second interview in early uh, October 1999. Well, so that's the remedy only, stage. Yeah. That was uh, after the conclusion of trial testimony. Right. And 
yeah. looking toward the remedy stage. The, the, only, the only comment that I could find, correct me if this isn't right, the only comment that I could figure out that might have that occurred before the findings of fact was the comment on um, the judge's views about integration. He wasn't a fan of integration. Is that, do you know of any other pre-finding of fact statements? Uh, I do not know of, of any that I can firmly fix prior to the findings of it, it appears the only, from the only, excuse, let me just the, and the only pre uh, conclusions of law comment I found other than obviously the integration one was the mule comment everything else seems to be post conclusions of law is that right I'm sorry uh, e everything I, else seems to be post conclusions of law uh, that uh, that appears to yeah. be that appears to be correct. Do we, and is isn't there the any timing? indication who initiated these interviews? Do we know how this happened? It was very unusual for reporters to be interviewing a judge mid-trial, whether it's a remedy or whether it's liability stage. Do we know whether Judge Jackson invited the reporters back or whether they of their own initiative went back? We know from uh, the uh, articles that some of the uh, uh, interviews occurred in chambers. Now, how that was initiated, I don't think we do know precisely. Uh, I think that was significant in the Halderman case. In that case, you recall the judge's birthday party and some yes, reporters. I, I do recall uh, the, the facts of Haldeman. Uh, and, uh, but in Haldeman, uh, <laughs> there was essentially one conversation that could be described with any definiteness. The conversations at the birthday party, as I recall, were disregarded by this court because the reports were too amorphous. Well, I think we acknowledge that it appeared that the judge was expressing an opinion. Uh, but not the precise nature of the opinion. The other circumstance in Haldeman, as I recall, was a brief television interview. And the suggestion was made in the decision that that had been almost uh, uh, forced upon the judge in connection with a circuit conference. I think those are the facts of Haldeman. But I don't but think... The, judge, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. the judge's comments in Haldeman are with respect to the issue before him, the question of, uh, of uh, the, the actual um, issue that was before the court that the judge spoke on is not... I can't distinguish it from the comment the district judge made here about he's not a fan of integration. I mean, they're both, they both go to the issue in the case, and in Haldeman, we, uh, we said that wasn't enough. A tinge of prejudgment or something like that was not enough to require recusal. Uh, I think that the statement in Haldeman dealt with the question which was not then pending in a focused way before the district court, about whether a fair trial could be had in the District of Columbia. And this court construed the district judge's remarks to be a general statement about the fairness of trials available in this district, as opposed to a statement directed at a specific issue in the case which would distinguish it from the integration suppose on, comment. Suppose the integration comment had been made in court. Suppose the judge had said exactly the same thing uh, after he issued, uh, right before he issued the findings of fact, and he was just saying during court, you know, I'm not a fan of integration. I want you all to know that. 455 recusal? I don't think so. Why not? Because... Judges may say many things in their opinions that they may not say uh, extrajudicially. Say all kinds of things on the bench, no? 
The judge. You heard, you we don't get paid. Yesterday. We have life tenure to say what we want on the bench, right? <laughs> the judge in Boston's children said, "This case is more complicated than another one." Period. I don't think anybody would urge that as a grounds for disqualification if said in court. On the other hand, the First Circuit believed that that was way over the line, which is what they say the standard is for securing mandamus in the First Circuit in these circumstances. Suppose Judge Tatel is right that it appears that there is a, 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 a picture is such that most of what was occurring that's questionable was post-trial, more towards the remedy stage. Well, uh, and certainly lots of it was. Uh, to begin with, it appears... Especially appear when you understand nothing is guaranteed. It's nothing's automatically void. There are things that are voidable. It appears that the uh, comments uh, were certainly made long before we reached the true remedy stage, which was in the spring of 2000. These were back in the fall of... 1999, and I believe they precede oh. the conclusions of law. All right, if we, uh, so that if, if, if we decide, if this court decides to set aside the remedy for other reasons, there's no reason to address this issue with respect to that, right? If the court agrees right. to vacate the remedy in its entirety for other reasons, right. I agree with you. Okay, so then we go back to statements prior to the conclusion. Are you also asking that we would vacate the conclusions of law and the findings of fact also? That's correct. Is that your theory? Even though there were only these two statements made, one right before the findings and one right before the conclusions? Uh, That's enough for a 455A recusal? I think there were multiple statements before the conclusions of law were if entered. You had, right. If you had made the motion below that Judge Rogers first suggested it was possible, I think, a, a post-trial motion to vacate judgment based on this, might we not then have the kind of record to support the kind of relief you're seeking? Since you did not make such a motion, might we not reasonably deem that you've de uh, waived any backward-looking vacation of finding of facts or conclusions of law, and I that your only remedy would be the replacement of the judge on any remand that might occur? I think not in the circumstances here, and I think that there is a... The circumstances here are we're dependent entirely on the hearsay accounts of New Yorker journalists and other journalists as to what was said and when. If there had been a motion to vacate, you might have made the kind of record that would let us answer the kinds of questions <laughs> we're now asking. Without that kind of record, uh, why shouldn't we simply enter a forward-looking remedy, if any, for the judge's apparent violation of... Uh, the rules and the statute, and forget about vacation based on that. I, I think for two reasons, uh, Judge Santel. Uh, one is uh, that what 455A is addressed to is the appearance of a lack of an impartial uh, uh, adjudicator. And I'm not sure how that speaks to what I just asked you. I think because it, the, the, what the statements suggest is actual bias. If that suggestion or if the occurrence of bias occurred after the entry of judgment and there were nothing before, would you agree that you would have no basis for vacating the judgment? No. You would not? I would not because there's no reason to believe that because the judge made the first statement before the entry of findings of fact and another series of statements uh, before the conclusions of law that the bias or the appearance of it began only with that statement. But wouldn't you think that would be illogical? I mean, he sat through a whole trial. What's, I mean, I, I would agree with you if he had said, I'm not a fan of integration before the trial started. But what can you point to in this record? I mean, we don't have much of a record, but you have, there's nothing other than your speculation that his views about speculation about integration didn't develop during trial. Uh, I think we have statements about Microsoft and its, its executives 
that would cause a reasonable person. No, no, stick with my question about integration. I, I, I'm, I, I understand your point about the Newton Street crew and Napoleon and the drug conspiracies, but I'm just asking about the integration point because that's the only one that's pre-findings of fact. And I just don't see any, any way of, other than your own speculation, for concluding that he had these views before the trial started. And don't we need to at least know that or have some basis for concluding it if we're going to vacate? Particularly since the standard for vacature is higher, isn't it? Well, the, the, I, I, I don't think in circumstances where there is concealment of the uh, improper statements and contacts that the standard is different. What case Bil says that? Liljeburg. Liljeburg, right. Yes. <laughs> where the concealed improper statements right. were not disclosed until after the decision had been made by the district court and affirmed on appeal. Yeah, but no, I agree with you about Lil Liljeburg. <laughs> but um, the court did set a, a slightly higher standard for vacature there. Um, risk of injustice to the parties, that's both parties. That's correct. That's not a standard we would apply if we were focusing on just what to do with this case on remand, should it be remanded, right? That there are other factors considered for a motion that, that was in that posture right. uh, when it reached the Supreme Court. Uh, I'd like to save a few minutes for rebuttal, if okay, I may. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank so. you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. On behalf of the governments, I have no brief to defend the district judge's decision to discuss this case publicly while it was pending on appeal, and I have no brief to defend the judge's decision to discuss the case with reporters while the trial was proceeding, even given the embargo on any report reporting concerning those conversations until after the trial. We that makes do, it even worse, doesn't it, Mr. Rohn? I'm sorry, Your Honor? His, his embargo makes it worse. Well, it makes, makes it... It makes his conduct worse, and the reason is exactly what Mr. Urowski said. That had he not placed that embargo, he would have been off that case in a minute. I don't disagree with that. Uh, well, I, uh, not the part about him being off the case. I don't disagree <laughs> that the embargo makes, makes it... Uh, the, it certainly doesn't make it any You really better. think that a judge engaging in ex-party contacts, and that comes to the attention on a mandamus, you really think the court would hesitate long if a district court judge is violating the code and, 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 and the integrity of the system by bringing in ex-party communicants during well, it, the process of the be, case? It would be violating certainly the canon uh, 3A6, but it certainly wouldn't necessarily be violating the code. Are there some that might suggest it violates our whole oath of office? It's not what we do. We do not have ex parte communications, and the code certainly says that. We neither initiate nor consider ex parte or other communications concerning a pending case. I don't discuss cases with my best friends. I mean, that's the way we operate. We're not supposed to do that. And we are not defending the judge's decision below to and do Certainly that. telling the person not to say anything, as Judge Randolph says, doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. But the question before the court is whether or not that shows bias or lack of impartiality uh, under or an appearance. The appearance of, appearance of a, a reasonable, reasonable person per that's right. would, would see a lack of impartiality from that before there's a violation of force. Is there any doubt under the uh, Tenth Circuit's, I'm sorry, the First Circuit's case that this would qualify? Well, the First Circuit case was a little the bit different. The judge said it was more com this case was more complex than another case. Well, but it's more complex in context in the sense that the judge was preparing to rule on a particular issue where that was directly pertinent. Um, and here you don't have that. Uh, what about the Newton Street comment? I'm sorry? The Newton Street crew comment. Oh, the, the, uh, the, that they get, always get caught uh, yeah. from talking on? No, I mean, well, uh, let's set aside the, the, the preference for in, the, 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 not a fan of integration. Set aside all these other things and just explain 
uh, keeping in mind that this is a, what a reasonable person would think about whether the judge was biased, not whether the judge is biased. The, the question is Newton whether the street crew. Yes. And the question is, does that reflect something right. that the judge learned during the proceedings, or does it reflect bias? In other words, something that he brought no, to no, the no, proceedings. No, 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 no. The question is, would a reasonable person hearing the comment think the judge is biased? Uh, my assumption is this. Let's assume, for purposes of my question, that he's not biased, that his Newton Street crew comment was, in his mind, simply, he was simply trying to articulate the point that lots of defendants don't concede they're guilty. Yes. Uh, okay? Microsoft Let's just assume elevates that. It to He's totally unbiased. But the public, a reasonable member of the public, hearing that comment, you, you're not suggesting, w would not wonder whether this judge is biased against the defendant who he analogized to it be... Is not, it, Perhaps I'm not following, Your Honor, but first of all, it is not an extrajudicial comment under the Supreme Court's decision in Leidecke. It is a reflection based on what he learned during the proceedings. As, Leidecke, by the way... The, the Leidecke, the comments were made in court. Well, that's a different question. Now, These the, comments were made out of court. But what the Leidecke court said is if the comments reflect what the judge learned during the but, proceedings, no, they're not... No, I understand that. And if he had said, I believe that this defendant is unwilling to acknowledge his wrongdoing, it seems to me you would have a good argument that that's a conclusion he reached from trial. I'm only asking you to focus on the analogy to the Newton Street crew and to all of the connotations that that conjures up for the public. Well, this is an appearance standard. It is an appearance standard, and all the judge is saying is that in his experience, criminal defendants, and he cited a particular example in a case that he was familiar with, are often uh, entrapped themselves by uh, continuing with conversations even after they know that they might be recorded. That's the drug trafficking comment, right. The Newton Street comment, well, both of them. It, I, I, it's hard for me to see, I mean, maybe you can help me with this. This is my problem with this issue. You can help me understand it. I don't understand how you can make the point when we're talking about an appearance standard, not a reality standard, but an appearance standard, that those two comments wouldn't convey bias, maybe not to you or not to me, but to your average member of the public. Oh, no, because, uh, no. again, it does matter that this reflects what was learned during the trial, because that is not bias. That is views formed during the trial. You're, I think you're missing and my point. My point is that if he had said, I believe this defendant is unwilling to concede that he is violated the law. That's a conclusion that he uh, reached during trial. I'm only, uh, he couldn't have reached, uh, I'm only asking you to focus on what the public would think well, about the Newton Street comment or the comment that they're like drug traffickers. Well, I mean, they're not, he, the judge, of course, and the, a reasonable member of the public would see this, was not saying that they're like drug traffickers in the sense of trafficking drugs. What he's saying is, what was remarkable about this is their emails continued to convey a, a compelling evidence for the government's case, even after they knew but that he chose emails. a particular metaphor. Right. Yeah. Metaphors are very yeah. powerful. And the metaphor he chose was the one best devised that you can imagine, except possibly the Holocaust, to indicate that Microsoft was beneath the pale, beyond the pale. Well, but that's missing how the analogy worked. The metaphor I was... No, I understand logically completely how the analogy worked. And I'm talking to, about specific yeah, conduct. There's no yeah, problem with A particular that. case that he had had in which this same phenomenon had occurred, and he was re re referencing it, and that you was know, Mr. Ross, what, the, what you're missing on the appearance was Judge Tatel suggesting to you on the appearance. There are a number of things, just like there are a number of things that counsel surmise after argument, not all very good in their minds. It, you, it doesn't occur to you to go out and announce all of the things that you feel. Mm -hmm. We have an even higher standard. There are lots of things that we think and feel about advocates and parties during the course of a proceeding. It doesn't mean that we're entitled to say because it w those feelings developed during the course of a proceeding, we're going to run off our mouths in a the pejorative way because there is an appearance problem. And yes, and there is an appearance do problem. It. For and that reason, and, and the system would be a sham if all judges went around doing this. And Newton that's Street are killers 
I mean, that's, these are the worst kinds of drug dealers, killers. That's what we're talking about. Well, that was the basis of the metaphor. He wasn't analogizing we them to We have to be why careful they're... about metaphors that we of use. Of course, of course. And we that's can what... slip some in court because you're there to slap us back, question us, or say you respectfully disagree. But when, when we do it in these other settings, the public has something at stake. It's the integrity of the system. And, and that's why there's canon of ethics, a judicial conduct, 3A6, that says you shouldn't do this, and we agree that it shouldn't be done. But well, what the is difference 455A? is... What, what, for, under your view, it's hard to see what role 455A plays. Well, I mean, I, I can let's let's I mean, I can see. Well, well, let's just assume that these are totally inappropriate statements under the canons. You still have the 455A issue. Yes, you still have to show right. the bias or the appearance. No, the of, appearance. Yes, but there's nothing in the in the abstract about discussing a case publicly that shows bias for one side yeah, or correct. the other. That's absolutely right. Nothing, uh, he could have a discussion about it uh, that would be a neutral discussion of, the, of the, the example I gave you. Well, you know, people, these people just don't concede that they're wrong. And the only thing well, that can, in, in an extrajudicial setting, and that's what we're dealing, uh, we're not dealing with the extrajudicial comments here because this reflects what the judge learned during trial and what the Supreme Court said in Lydicke that those are not a basis for a bias Extra or partiality. Extrajudicial in the sense that it's not in the courtroom subject to the opportunity of counsel to respond and to make records on these subjects. And I have to ask you what possible legitimate reason, if you're a member of the public and you're trying to decide whether it, are you forming an impression as to whether the judge is biased or not, what possible legitimate reason could you assign to a judge who's going to media reporters and making derogatory comments about the parties to a lawsuit that had been tried in front of him unless the judge were biased against him. Uh, he has the courtroom forum to do all the legitimate things he needs to do to Microsoft or the government or any other litigant. What's, what's the unbiased reason for a judge to go out and well, go into his chambers and hold secret conferences with reporters to say bad things what, about a litigant? What, <coughs> what Your Honor is suggesting is, is that it is improper to engage in that conduct. So but it is conduct? It yes, to. absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not disputing that, Your Honor, and but I began so by noting that, that I... But it's so that it's going to look, isn't it likely that it's going to look to a member of the public as if this judge has some other axe to grind, or he wouldn't be doing something that improper? It is improper. I think the, perhaps the best that can be said about it's it... It's beyond the pale. I mean, that's what we're saying to you. It is so extraordinary. The, imp, imp, the ex parte contacts... It's so high as what Judge Santel is saying. How can anyone assume anything other than the worst? Well, what is the assumption? The leap in logic that hasn't been filled in is because there was an improper discussion of the case in public, that somehow shows actionable bias. Raises an appearance of. Or appearance, appearance. appearance of lack of impartiality. I'm not saying actual bias. Appearance. Toward. Toward one side or the other. The one That's that he different. compared to the Newton Street crew and the one that he accused of not being adept at business ethics would be likely the one he might be biased against. And when you get to the content, and that is where if, you, if the discussion is going to be under 455, putting aside no dispute that this is improper under 3A6, if the discussion is under 455, then you have to show the, the deep-seated favoritism or antagonism that would make fair judgment impossible. And you don't show that if what the comments reflect are what the judge learned during the proceedings. Give me an example of a, give me an example of something he no, might have said that you, would con that you would concede would be a basis for 455A recusal. 455A recusal would be a comment from experience not drawn from the trial, starting before the trial. You know, I don't like big companies. I'd like to, you know, if I get a chance, I'd like to break up any big company I can get my hands on. That would be bias. That would not be drawn from the experience at the trial. It would be something the prejudice the judge brought to the trial, not something he took from it. So does it have to be then after the completion of the trial that he makes the statement so that he's heard everything from both sides? No. For example, so if he makes the, the statement after hearing just from the government and says, well, this, this defendant seems to be like the drug dealers, 
um, and then maybe hears from the from the defendant later and changes his view. He has not given the appearance of bias. No, not under the Supreme Court's decision in Leidecke. They draw a sharp line between whether the judge is reflecting what he learned during the proceedings. They, and the they, draw, that line, they draw that line, but they very explicitly say the fact that an opinion held by a judge derives from a source outside judicial proceedings is not a necessary, underscored, condition for bias or prejudice recusal. Of course. You have to show that the content of the statement itself reflects actionable bias. The well, mere wait, fact... What, what we said in Microsoft One was facts might reasonably cause an objective observer to question the judge's impartiality. And what Microsoft One involved, a decision, the judge, according to the Court of Appeals, was basing his decision on a, on a book, an extrajudicial source. Well, with respect to some of the ex-party contacts, we made it very clear in that decision it didn't matter whether the judge considered them. We said it was the fact of the ex-party contact that was so troublesome. That's the point that I'm so, so distressed about. You're not dealing with, it was the fact. That's exactly what we said in Microsoft One. Your Honor, I'm not dealing with the fact of an ex-party contact because we don't dispute that the ex-party contacts were wrong. But what we and do dispute... And gave an appearance, reached the appearance problem that we're concerned about. The, the leap, again, that we, we don't think has been surmounted is showing that this, this discussion with the reporters or the public discussion after the... Uh, uh, to trial was over show bias. Yeah, it seems to me no, you're confusing, not, yeah. you're confusing right. two things, Mr. Roberts, with, with all, all respect. It, we have a statute, it's 140, 28 U.S.C. 144 that requires judges to step down for bias or prejudice. And it can serve as a basis for an action. That's one type of disqualification. We're not talking about that here. What we're talking about is 455, section 455 which is directly copied word for word from, uh, except for one thing, from Canon 3. I don't know if you realize that, but it, that, that Canon 3 came first and then Congress enacted it into law. So we're talking about a violation of Canon 3 and necessarily a, we're also talking about a violation of 455 because if it doesn't violate 455, there's no remedy. Well, uh, if I may... Now, now Justice Sco uh, Scalia, I think it was, Latecki, and, and he said, recusal is required whenever there's a genuine question concerning a judge's impartiality. And a genuine question. You don't have to show bias. Is there a question whether Judge Jackson was impartial? And these comments to reporters, and my colleagues are suggesting to you, raise a question about his impartiality. And if, it, if they do, then recusal was required. This court established in the Barry case, and I believe in the Haldeman case as well, that a transgression of the canons do, does not establish a violation of 455. Not necessarily. Not necessarily established. The exactly. canons say that. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting otherwise. The canons say that. I'm suggesting to you that 455 is a copy of Canon 3. There is, you admit, a violation of Canon 3. If there is a gross violation of Canon 3, the, the authorities also say that that can lead to a, to a violation of the statute. You agree with that, don't you? I, they're separate questions. It is certainly pertinent, I think, in assessing under 455 what the canons provide. But as the Barry case establishes, a violation of the canons do, does not automatically lead to a violation of 455. I'm not suggesting it does. What about and a again, gross violation of Canon 3? It would depend on the connection, and the difference here is that the gross violation if, of, of Canon 3 is the public discussion, the ex-party contacts with the reporters and the public discussion. That by itself does not establish bias or a lack of impartiality. The clearest example does it, I does it raise appearance? a question? Does it raise a question not, of impartiality? Well, That's the issue. You have to look at the content of the statements and determine the source of the statements. I guess the easiest example I can give is let's suppose a judge has an improper ex parte contact and what he says is this was a wonderful case, both sides did a wonderful job, uh, I have no other, no other views about uh, uh, the merits. Now, is that a violation of the canons? Yes, because he's not supposed to All be All you're happy. doing is highlighting the gravity of the situation here, because your hypothetical is not close to what happened. 
No, uh, Your Honor, with respect... We don't have to worry about that. He, he went on for hours and hours and hours in an ex-party contact with employers who were given access to chambers to hear his views and apparently to take some of their views on an ongoing case. It but does, he did it's nowhere not... near your hypothetical. We all agree it's only a voidable standard. We agree with that. But your hypothetical highlights the problem here. He's so far from anything that seems benign that that's what we're concerned about. No, the, the question, he did not go on for hours and hours The and interviews hours. went on for hours and hours. They may have gone on for hours, but and the that point gives, is... You don't think that the public at large watching the system doesn't look at that and say, good heavens, is that what judges do? If you they were... take preferred reporters in and they'll discuss with them what's going on in a case and listen to their views and take their views on reactions from the public and then show them all their notes. You don't and think parties should be distressed about that? And if that's all they know, will their conclusion be, well, he's therefore biased against the defendant? Or oh, he's appearance, biased appearance. But the appearance is still, the question is the appearance of partiality. See, and Mr. See, Roberts, I, see, I, I actually, I completely agree with you. Uh, and we may, we may not totally agree up here, because I completely agree with you that repeated violations of the canons are not in and of themselves, is not in and of itself a basis for 455A recusal. I agree with you about that. He could have said what you said a hundred times, times, and it wouldn't have been a basis for recusal. To me, the problem here, uh, and I also agree with you uh, on your reading of Ledecky, that is that views acquired by a trial judge or an, any judge during the course of the proceedings can't be a basis for recusal unless they reveal deep-seated antagonism. Okay, I agree with that. The, the problem I see here is the way in which he characterized his views about the defendants when we are applying an appearance of impropriety standard. That's where I'm stuck. And that brings me back to phrases like the analogy to the Newton Street crew and to the drug traffickers and to uh, uh, Bill Gates' ethics. Um, they may all have been ways of expressing his way of expressing his views gained at trial. And had they been stated in other terms, they might have been fine. But the words he chose, I just don't see how you get around the fact that the words he chose convey to the average member of the public bias. Well, my main point That's the problem. is, again, Your Honor, it's the Leidecke point, and this, and the reasonable observer would have to take well, this into in account, yeah. is, would be that this was not gained during the trial. The other part about it, uh, again, these handful of statements, and any, of course, one is too many, but the point is we're dealing with a discrete number, are not a basis for vacating findings of fact that are fully supported by the record. Uh, at each turn, uh, the findings when of fact... When you say a discrete number of statements, do you recall any case ever in which a trial judge made as many statements about ongoing litigation to reporters as Judge Jackson made in this oh, case? Oh, Your Honor, I don't. But it may be a discrete number, but it's the biggest number that has ever occurred, right? Well, and... and <laughs> How are we going to draw a line that's going to exclude anything? And I, as I said, any, any one of them, of course, would have been too many. But the findings of fact are fully supported in the record. Uh, there are yeah, two separate... Do you, do you, excuse me, go ahead. Finish your sentence. I was just going to say there are two separate questions, whether the judge's conduct was proper and whether or not the judgment should be vacated. Uh, and those require separate analyses. We believe the findings of fact are exhaustively supported by the record. The fact that the judge may have... But trans the standard of review for findings of fact that we discussed some yesterday involves affording a presumption of regularity to the judge's findings. If the judge is not an unbiased trier of fact, doesn't the underpinning for us applying the clearly erroneous standard to the findings of fact evaporate? And this is where the Leidecke point becomes critical, because if the bias is something the judge brought to the proceedings, yes, then you'd wonder whether the findings of fact were entitled to the deferential standard of review. But if, under Leidecke, what the comments uh, reflect are what the judge learned during the trial, then there's no basis... for doing anything other than affording them the traditional, Roberts, clearly erroneous standard. What about the remark made to Oletta 
What I want to do is to confront the Court of Appeals with an established factual record, which is a fait accompli. And any part of the inspiration uh, for doing that is that I take mild offense at their reversal of my preliminary injunction in the consent decree case. So we're, he shares with us uh, part of his purpose in writing the findings of fact, which you say are well supported and maybe are. Well, what I understand that to be is an explanation for the separation of the findings of fact from the conclusions of law, which to me is no pertinence whatsoever. It doesn't make the findings any more supported or any less supported. I would have thought, uh, your, answer to, I would have thought your answer would have been, of course he's upset at getting reversed. No one likes to get upset, right. get reversed, and that doesn't show bias. No. <laughs> no that's also a good How about that answer? That's, uh, <laughs> That's also a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, this court either. <laughs> what this court said in the Southern Pacific case, when it was confronted with a situation where the allegation of bias was made, and the argument was, therefore, do something other than apply Rule 52A, the clearly erroneous standard, is the court said, no, we apply, the standard is the same. We will apply it with painstaking care. Now, we encourage the court to apply the clearly... What did you just say I said in Southern Pacific? <laughs> <laughs> you, you rejected the argument that you should alter the standard of review, but you said you would examine the findings of fact with painstaking care in light of... I think the I said prospectively. I, I, this case is not like one I'll see in, uh, what, five years? Uh, <laughs> and, and what we would encourage not the close. court to do is to examine the findings of fact with the painstaking care because we are confident when the court does that, it will find that the record fully supports each of if the district court's findings. If we're affording the presumption that if an unbiased trier of fact has made these findings, then it is rational to say if there is evidence to support that finding, then we must uphold it. If we do not indulge the presumption of impartiality on the basis, on the part of the finder of fact, then it's no longer rational to subject it to that lax standard of review. If there are disputed questions of fact, why is the one chosen by the trier of fact entitled to deference anymore if he's not an unbiased finder of fact? Your Honor, again, the, the, the question is whether the statements show uh, views gleaned from the trial, in which case you would expect them to be consistent with the findings of fact. Or be your position then, or am I misstating it to say that in order to change the standard of review on findings of fact, there must be evidence of actual as opposed to an appearance of bias? Is that I, don't, I don't think changing the standard of review for factual findings is, is in, the, in the cards. Uh, I think Southern Pacific answers that. Setting it aside might be. Setting aside the judgment might be. Might be. Certain, if, if bias is found and if bias it, from before the proceedings, not from the proceedings, is found, that is an option Mr. for the Roberts, court. You, but you're constantly saying that you have to find bias, and I don't think that's the law. Uh, but, let, me, I, let me give you an example. Let, let, let's suppose sure. that I were sitting on a case, and it just so happens that my best, closest personal friend was you. Now, I can... I sh that creates an appearance of impropriety. I should recuse myself if we have a very close social relationship. And there are, there, there are rulings by the Codes of Conduct Committee so stating. But I don't have a bias about the case. I've just created an appearance of impropriety. I've created an appearance of lack of, 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 of being a neutral judge. And Burke's were the, the cold neutrality of, the, of an impartial judge. It's the appearance that I've created. I don't have an actual bias. And the question here is, what kind of an appearance for the public did Judge Jackson create? Not whether he was actually biased or not. I, and, and in fact, I, I almost <coughs> agree with you that if everything he said to Mr. Aletta and the other people, he said in open court that I don't think a motion under 144 to disqualify him would stand. And that's the point you keep making. I think you're probably right about that. But the, key, the point you keep avoiding is, what kind of an appearance did he create? And I think you do have to separate the questions. What is objectionable about the appearance? Is it ex parte contacts, public statements while the matter is proceeding, or is it that those statements show bias and partiality? I think those are two different questions. No one's disputing, no one's disputing the... Uh, 
transgression with respect to the canon of ethics against public comment. But that's very different from saying that creates an appearance of partiality, what? as opposed to an appearance of violating the canons for lack of discretion. Let, let, me, let me come at this, at, at Judge Randolph's question, a different way. I've been, uh, I've been thinking uh, for the last 15 minutes about your answer to my question about an example of a violation of 455A. And the one you gave was a judge who says, I'm against breakups, right? I think the judge in this case who said, I, I, I am in favor of breakups. Well, either way. Oh, right. That's an example of a judge being biased. The question we have to apply here is the appearance of bias. Well, and you're That's where we're disagreeing, I think. You, you gave an example of actual bias. Well, an appearance of, uh, I suppose it's difficult to imagine. Well, of course, I mean, I mean, somebody's absolutely biased, they're going to appear biased, but the Newton Street crew is, is a different kind. And your, your theory of 455A doesn't seem to account, at least I haven't understood how you account, in your theory of 455A, for the difference between a case of actual bias and a case where the judge is not at all biased, as I'm willing to assume here, but may appear to be biased. Well, I don't that's think... What, that's what you... I, you just haven't gotten me there yet. Well, if... I, again, with the Newton Street crew, I don't think a reasonable observer is going to say the judge thinks these people are drug dealers. They're going to say example, the judge then. gave give, a very... Give me an example, then, of a case... Where, of a, let me ask you my earlier question. Give me an example of a 455... Of a, of a judicial statement uh, that is not of actual bias, but that, uh, that you would concede gives the appearance of, of bias? Oh, I mean, the, the judge complaining that he can't get his computer to work uh, uh, and, and suggesting that the fault is with the company, that wouldn't show that he's unable to evaluate the merits of the case, but reason, an observer might suggest that it would. Uh, it's hard to imagine, other than the personal relationship type of thing that Judge Randolph was talking about, where there would be an appearance. But again, the overriding point is there's a different question between the propriety of the judge's conduct and the validity of the judgment based on the findings of fact. Okay. That distinction needs Just to one, be kept one quick in mind. question. Do, do you have a position on the court's suggestion in Liteke that there's a uh, laxer standard for under 2106? for removal of the judge going forward? Well, certainly there is a laxer standard. This court has, in the past, uh, applied a, uh, remanded a case to a different judge, even in a situation when it has rejected a finding of, of, of bias. Um, and that is a matter of institutional uh, control rather than the, uh, code, uh, the judicial code. Would the government take a position on whether we should put a different judge in charge if we remand this case? The position, our position is that you should not remand it to a different judge for the reasons we've said. We don't think that the... Even, even forward-looking, you would still go with this judge after these comments? Because we don't think the comments show, show bias, and there are serious institutional I understand costs. that you were not the attorney for at the trial stage here, but suppose the judge had said, you know, after watching Mr. Roberts' conduct during this trial, I think he's a, a, a technically very good lawyer, but not real adept at legal ethics. Would you feel that you could get a fair trial going back before that judge? As a, the lawyer appearing before the judge, I think the, it would be different than a discussion about the clients. But you the, do think it would raise at least an appearance of bias towards you, do you not? The, the judge commenting on the lawyer's ethics in that matter? How about, yes. Yeah, but here it's a party's ethics. Should the party be less sensitive to bias than an attorney so that the party should think, I can get a very fair trial, there's no appearance of partiality or bias against me by a judge who questions the, my ethics? The comment reflects exactly the findings of fact about a violation of the Sherman Act uh, by the judge based on the evidence that he saw. I think you're back to re wanting us to require a reality as opposed to an appearance of bias when you make that response to me, aren't you, uh, Mr. Well, Roberts? I, what I'm not sure that I see how you can, with a straight face, ask us if we remand to send it to the same judge after these comments. Well, we don't think that they show, the comments show bias, and we don't think, although they show 
transgression of the canons, they don't show bias or a lack of impartiality, and that is a, an important distinction. All right. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I have just a couple of uh, uh, points, Your Honor. Uh, in response to uh, what Mr. Roberts said, I, I guess I have two points. One, I don't take Leidecke to mean that a judge who receives information in the course of a proceeding is then free to speak about impressions he's drawn about litigants in an extrajudicial context. So it really doesn't make any difference if the judge's uh, views derived from uh, presiding over the case. Uh, second, uh, in regard to uh, the notion that the comments made by the judge don't reflect bias, they certainly could be misinterpreted by a reasonable per person, and that was central to the First Circuit's holding in Boston's children. Uh, Let me ask you just one question about Lilji Berg, which you used as the prototype for redressive or backward-looking relief. Had not the parties in that case made the motion to the judge below to set aside that you didn't make in this case? Uh, not initially. Uh, uh, it's a bit complicated. What happened was the judge did not disclose. But the word didn't get out until after judgment, but until there was a motion the in the district judgment court. judgment had been affirmed yeah. on appeal. Right, right, right. That's, that's correct. But there was a motion in the district court before the question of setting aside came to the Court of Appeals. That motion had been made in the district court, had it not? That is the only place that motion could have been made, I think, because the case was back in the district court. Nonetheless, you haven't made any attempt at any point to get any relief from the district court based on this in the present litigation. Right? Well, I, I don't think that uh, right. at this point we can go. So to the, the force of Liljeburg as a precedent is a bit. I'm not saying it isn't on your side, but it isn't compelling, even if it were a controlling case. Well, I think it's compelling in this respect. Uh, it holds, among other things, that a judge has under 455A has an independent obligation to disclose to the parties disqualifying circumstances. Yeah. I'm simply wondering about the breadth of the relief. I'm not asking you to yield any ground on the propriety of some relief. I, I'd like to address that as well because I, I think I may have uh, uh, been uh, a, a little bit of a failed uh, advocate in trying to respond to some of Judge Tatel's questions. Having had a moment to think about the questions Judge Tatel raised about the timing of the statements, I come to the conclusion that that is not really, that ought not to be the crux of the issue. The question is, whenever the statements were made, do they create the appearance that the district court was not impartial? And the making of the statements, even subsequent to judgment, while this case was pending in this court, would create the impression, have created the impression, on the part of the public that the judge was not impartial. And that is the rule of law, I think, that has to be applied here. Thank when, you. When was the... Uh what was the date of the final uh, judgment? Uh, it's uh, June. It, it's the first week of June 2000. And, and how soon thereafter did you file a notice of appeal? Uh, five or six days. Once you file a notice of appeal, uh, Judge Jackson loses jurisdiction, does he not? That's correct. And so unless you had enough information from reports, and when was the New Yorker article? Uh, that's considerably later, and the Oletta book is considerably after that. So the, w once you file the notice of appeal, the district court loses jurisdiction, and the district court therefore lost jurisdiction within five days of the judgment. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. When were the first extrajudicial statements reported? As far as we know, uh, the first statement was the one uh, Judge uh, Tatel uh, adverted to earlier 
about uh, I'm not a great fan of integration, and that was made prior to the when was, was it reported. reported? Well, we know we know the interview was right before the findings of fact, right? Uh, I'm, I'm shortly before it. I, I'm I'm sorry, I didn't remember in the moment myself. My well, colleagues tell me yeah. the fall of 2000. See, fall what, of 2000. What, what I think your response to my questions doesn't account for, and maybe you maybe you can explain that you are, is the Ledecky principle that a judge that the the views formed by a judge during trial cannot form a basis for recusal unless they reveal deep-seated antagonism. Uh, and so we have to be careful to make sure that the views we are considering as a basis for 455A are views that were not appropriately obtained during the trial, don't we? No, I don't think so. Otherwise, you're eliminating that immunity. No, I don't think so. Uh, and one of the bases, as I understand it, for uh, the First Circuit's decision in Boston's children is the ease with which public statements of the nature made by the judge in that case and by the district judge in this case can be avoided. And the problem is that whether the views are derived from experiences uh, uh, presiding over the case or not, once resort is had to the public media. Well, see, now you're suggesting an automatic rule. Any public statement is a basis for recusal, and well, you, that's not right. Any public statement of a derogatory nature of this degree, I think, is unquestionably uh, a, a violation of 455. Okay. Your time uh, is up, Mr. Yaroski. Yes, uh, I, I'd like to thank the court for permitting me the honor to address it yesterday. I'd like today. to, before we... Uh, uh, adjourn. I'd like to thank the parties uh, for your, the fine efforts in your presentations, for your cooperation in submitting the CD runs, which were immensely useful. After to today's us. conclusion of the oral the arguments case, in the appeals case, United States versus the court has worked very, very hard to try and get a grasp of the case and deal with the issues seriously. It is a matter of great import. We take it very seriously, and we'll do so as we consider it. And I'd, I'd like to thank all sides uh, for their efforts to assist us in our job. The, the case is submitted. Thank you. After today's conclusion of the oral arguments in the appeals case, United States versus Microsoft Corporation, attorneys spoke with reporters outside the courthouse. It's about a half hour. My name is uh, Boyden Gray, 